r slash ask science fiction. Super Real says. Stargate are the replicators powerful, or are they just against weak opponents? Got into a debate with my friend and the question kind of popped up. In the Stargate universe, the replicators are eventually considered a massive threat. They practically solo the Asgards and the only threat bigger are the literal gods. But the only reason the replicators ever got to that point was because the Asgard have no idea how to fight an opponent like them. The Asgards are kind of idiots gbh, their solution to every problem for thousands of years has always been make superior technology, and despite that they can't even handle the gold. Because of Asgard's solution to make more tech, the replicators kept getting stronger and stronger as they absorbed the technology, or whatever and kept growing. So my question is, are the replicators an actual threat to other Sifi worlds, where advanced civilizations actually know how to fight, or are they a minor threat, that blew out of proportion, because they were a hard counter to the Asgards? Spirit Ed Teacher 9482 says. I read the tag as, Star Trek, rather, the Stargate, and for a moment thought Op was really invested in that series occasional vending machine malfunctions. Luke Ombriel says. How and where did you get the idea that the Empire that, with one single ship, not only halted, but erased a gold invasion force and that forced a partially ascended gold to flee the field, just by showing up in their latest ship design, and which kept the gold from invading their number one enemy and thousands of other worlds just by saying no invading, can't handle the gold. And just because you can kill something with buckshot, doesn't mean you can easily win a war against it. Want an example? Any random us soldier can be killed with buckshot, does that mean you are prepared to take on an aircraft carrier? Even with the help of Carter they were only able to kill some replicator ships with a suicide tactic, and I doubt the US Enterprise would stand much more of a chance against a replicator ship than it did a Borg cube. Papa Duke says. I copy you and your friend, and I'm better or worse equipped to overtake you, and consume the next closest life forms to you, or worse. Sensitive Hotel 9871 says. I saw the Asgard replicators brought up, so I will bring up the Pegasus replicators. Those would definitely be dangerous, because their manufacturing capabilities can crank out dozens of warships in less than a year. By this point, the protagonists did have a ship that outgunned them, but the replicators could build ships faster than the heroes could blow them up without the plan to take out all the replicators at once. Also, the replicators are much more pragmatic than the typical Stargate villains. When programmed to kill the Wraith, rather than taking on their numerically superior enemy, they targeted the humans the Wraith needed to feed on. They would have won simply by starving their enemy to death. Starving Carnivore says. No answer, but I do find it funny that the Tori are enlisted by the Asgard to fight the replicators, because simple projectile weapons are somehow too dumb for the Asgard to understand or operate. It'd be like getting a gorilla with a huge wooden club to defend you. Litter Boxer says. The ancients had ridiculously powerful weapons just casually scattered throughout at least three galaxies, but they couldn't beat the much much weaker Wraith, because they got overwhelmed by orders of magnitude more ships and troops in almost every single battle. The Wraith fleet that attacked, and sank Atlantis was probably one of the largest fleets assembled by anyone in the entire universe. The replicators waited until the Wraith won that war with that fleet, and were at the peak of their strength, and within weeks had destroyed tens of thousands of Wraith ships, to the point the Wraith gave up fighting altogether, and came up with a technical solution instead by getting lucky, and finding a way to hack the replicators. All that is to say, only luck spared the Wraith, and therefore the whole universe. The vast majority of the Montechi people and only outliers like Todd or Michael are ever really using all of their brain at once. Unless other universes have similar lucky geniuses, the replicators smash them to pieces, or at least the Azure and ones do. R slash ask science fiction. Earth Salt says. X-Men can Kitty Pride phase your bones out of your body? With follow-up questions. Title. Follow-up question. Could she do this to Wolverine? 
And if she did, would she take the adamantium skeleton with her? Could she just remove the adamantium from his bones? Waligarg says. No, she could not remove the adamantium from the bones. Anyone who writes it that she could, doesn't understand her powers, or how Logan's bones are bonded. They are bonded, woven and interlaced pretty much at a molecular level, it's not like the adamantium is plated straight over the top. Kitty would take the entire skeleton with her, she doesn't have the fine level of control to separate things at that level. Mew4 Seshulace says. An extreme reoccurring theme of x men is that every mutant has much more extreme powers than they do normally, and their superhero powers are just however they conceptualize their near-infinite gift at the age of like 14. Almost every major character has had a run of what, if you just did x with your power where they do, and realize their powers are much bigger than whatever they conceptualize them as then eventually have to get bopped on the head so they forget, or otherwise need to tone back down to normal power levels. Rorano Pedro says. Yes to all of the above, just would take a while. Unspoken questions, yes she would make a sword with some of the bones. Yes she would use the rest of the skeleton as a cool decoration piece for the living room. Yes it would turn into a hanger for her and Magic's coats, they're really the same coats, it's whoever picks it up first that determines it. Yes Logan would be kinda mad, when he inevitably came back to life but I mean, over time, he'd think it was kinda funny. An emancipated Spambert says. One time Kitty phased her and her team. Then cut them loose from their relative position on the earth. The earth's rotation kept going. Thus allowing them to travel hundreds of miles. She's quite powerful. I would say yes she can do it. But probably has restraint from actually doing it to foes. Conscious and unconscious restraint. De Gordy says. Yes she can, Maro found that out when her powers wigged out, and pride removed her from the majority of her skeleton. Yes she can, his bones aren't any more attached to him than a normal human's. Maybe, it depends on exactly how bonded they are. Given that Magneto can remove it without taking the rest of his skeleton with it, I would lean towards yes she can. Equivalent Yak8215 says. Yes. Yes. And yes. Pride can take whatever the frick she wants off a person. Or put whatever the frick she wants inside a person. She has a broken power honestly, and the only reason she doesn't just walk around ripping brains out is because she's very nice. R slash ask science fiction. Sabratooth1100 says. Dune wire and small slash baby sandworms a bigger issue. In Dune 2, 2024, we see a very young sandworm swimming around in a pit in a Fremen temple. It seems quite fast, and aggressively attacks its handler. Why aren't these things, or just non-huge worms in general, encountered much more often than the large ones? Surely the smaller ones could get almost right up to the rock formations too, I'd think it would never be safe to walk normally. Chemix says. Water is poisonous to sandworms. So the small ones won't purposely go after people and the big ones are so big, that they don't care. Mew4 Seshulace says. The main thing sandworms eat is sandworms. Their whole biology is having a trillion babies, the babies going all over, and converting all the water into spice, and then being eaten by the big sandworms until there is only a few giant ones. Listen, if that doesn't make sense, assume spice is allowing some space science to happen. Horn Python says. They don't go for surface prey, because chances are a big worm would be headed that way too. R slash ask science fiction. Be risk good boys says. Star Trek, why do uniforms have no pockets, and how do officers carry anything that can't be controlled by a communicator? TH3V3 gas says. Utility belts are in style. Casijo says. Simple, fanny packs. It's the way of the future. I am Ginny 5 i says. 
are post-capitalism. Hatemagut says. Prison Wallet. Fivagut says. Around season 4 of Voyager Blana gets a jacket with pockets, possibly something she programmed into the replicator herself though. Feather Sigil says. Pretty sure we've seen Starfleet uniforms with pockets, but what would they need pockets for? Everything's in digital form and easily accessible from any of the thousands of terminals on a starship, all of which are voice controlled. Come badges and vocal access codes are login credentials. Doors are automatic, unless commanded to lock. Tools like trick orders and phasers are only carried by approved personnel as needed, and they attach to belts anyway. If somebody happens to need a specific handheld object that isn't already available, they can just replicate one. Their version of the extra universal technology known as a smartphone could simply be a tricord light in the form of a wristband with hollow emitters, or even a dermal neural interface like the ones the Delta Quadrant Borg had. The Big Mac says. A lot of the designs in the technical manuals have pockets, albeit small ones. There's a great book called, I Ike, Costuming Star Trek and they have some mentions of pockets, pouches, utility belts and occasionally bags. A lot of the 90s action figures even came with clip-on pouches, belts, and bags that fit each of their tools. Remedy says. At the time of Lower Decks they got pockets. So at some point they decided it is good idea after all. Ifsesk says. Prison pocket, obvs. Paholg says. They do have pockets of a sort. Any time a phaser or trick order is needed, there's a pocket-like attachment for it. I'm not sure if they need to change to special away mission uniforms for these, or if they attach to the fabric somehow. Rorano Pedro says. In the future we just let go of pockets alongside capitalism. No, sometimes the uniform people make a bad fit, that's all. There's plenty of uniforms with pockets in other shows and also jackets, pants, shirts, dresses, as well as a variety of practical choices. Even back in Kirk's time they had concealed pockets in the front. The TNG ones were just particularly bad. I hear Captain Pickard had circulation issues with his PR nightmare, Starfleet had to change it immediately. Android Mid says. Starfleet uniforms TNG and on, actually did have discrete pockets allowing those who were issued a type 1 phaser, to conceal it on their person. As well as isolinea chips, data modules, at least several cases of auto injectors slash hyposprays, and in multiple instances in Enterprise even trick orders had specialized pockets. This is true for both the on-screen costumes worn by actors as well as canonized in the script, and referenced in books. In TNG both Riker and Wesley as examples have several scenes, where it's very obvious they are drawing their type 1 phaser from a purpose-built pocket. That's all for this video thank you for watching please subscribe.